to onboard Java. And uh, just so I can get an idea of how much experience we have, has anyone here used uh, either blocked programming or onboard Java in the past? Has anyone done any programming in the past? Okay. So unlock Java uh, is what my team personally uses. We find it can do everything that Android Studio can do with a lot less hassle because Android Studio takes a lot more, it, it's just more complicated to get the programs from the computer to the robot and if you can't use it from a web browser. With Unbot Studio, you just go to your, or sorry, with Uncut Java, you just go to your web browser, uh, put in your URL, and click on Unbot Java. Uh, and then the first thing that you do is make the program. And then uh, the location you'll want to keep as this uh, one default. You can't do that to me, I don't know if that. Uh, and then you can click on any of these sample programs here. There's a lot of sample programs, as you can see, more than there is in blocks. Uh, the main ones that uh, I find helpful have been the basic uh, linear op mode, which I don't know if there's actually a difference here. Uh, and then your tensor flows and some of the sensor ones at the bottom. Uh, for now, I'm just going to do a basic linear auto, which I click on the sample for everything because it kind of gives you that skeleton code that you want for creating a program. Um, yeah, so then once you create your program, it appears on the side. Here it is in alphabetical order, and it opens up your program. And uh, if you don't know anything about Java, this is your first time then I'm going to help you uh, learn a little bit about the syntax and some of the basic Java code, as well as the FTC specific code. Uh, so the way that this program is going to be organized is, first, it'll import all of the code that's specific to uh, basically like what the parts of your motor are. So there's code it needs to import for the DC motors. There's you know, anytime you add a sensor or a servo, it'll import more code to work with your sensors and servos and um, TensorFlow, all of that. Most of it will be automatically imported, so you probably won't have to touch this very much. Okay, and then down here you have your uh, like code that's specific to this program. So you have the name of your code, and this name does need to match up here so you can't uh, edit it. If you try to change the name, then it'll pop up with you um, as errors. And then down here, you have the run op mode. So basically, when you click initialize, uh, that's when this code is going to start. Everything that's in these brackets will only begin once you initialize your program. And then what it'll do is it'll go through all of what is above your wait for start key. And you will need to have a line of code that says wait for start. Otherwise, your program is going to be breaking a lot of rules. Uh, so basically, when you start the program, you'll be doing all of your initialization blocks, which I'll go over here in a minute. And then once your robot is done initializing, it'll wait until you actually hit that triangle play button. And then once you hit the start button, it'll uh, advance to any code that's below the wait for start. So first thing I'll go over real quick is just a little bit of basic Java for anyone who's here with absolutely no programming experience. So Java is its own language. Uh, it's used in a lot of different things. It's kind of the basic starter language for many people learning programming. And Onbot Java uses a lot of that code, but then also adds a ton of code that's FTC specific. But anything that you use in Java that's like a for loop or um, in blocks and variables, you're going to be using all of that here in the Onbot Java. So for instance, creating a variable, I'll create my uh, variable to for a promoter. So uh, also something nice about Onbot is that when you start typing, uh, you can enable basically autocomplete, which if you don't quite remember exactly like what the name of uh, you know method is that you're trying to do, 
you can start it and then scroll down the list to find the, uh, what you're looking for. And if you like start to misspell something, a lot of times it'll help you catch any misspellings or like you just cap it a little, like when you mis when you have the wrong capitalization. So uh, I strongly recommend you keep autocomplete like active. It's very helpful. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So first, when you are initializing uh, something that if you're uh, used to blocks programming, uh, then this might be a little odd to you, but you configure all of your motors using the driver station, and then once you configure them all, you need to um, basically assign all of your configurations to a uh, variable in the job. How you do that is, uh, for a motor, you would do DC motor, and then give it a name. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call mine the Lazy Susan. Uh, here's my demo, I have a Lazy Susan. And then you created that and you need to do a hardware map dot get. Yeah. Right, so here what we're doing is we're giving the variable type. In this case the variable type is DC motor. Uh, other variables are sensors and servos, uh, and also the normal job variables of int, double, and boolean. And an integer, if you don't know anything about Java, integers are whole numbers, like 1, 2, 3, 735, all those. A double is any number that has a decimal, like 0.72 or 3.5 or 3.5. Um, and then a boolean is true or false. So that's the only thing it can be, it can either be true or false. So here we gave it the variable type of DC motor. We gave it a name. So anytime later in the programming, we're going to be using this variable. Uh, we won't be saying DC motor. We'll just be saying Lady Susan. Uh, and this variable name can be anything. But again, you probably want to give it something that uh, is like related to what the variable is. So I will not be using many names just like A or B or something like that. I would give it names that you can easily identify looking back at the program three weeks after you've lost it. So after giving it a type and a name, you will be setting it equal to something. And you do that with just an equal sign and then what value you want to assign to the variable. In this case, we want our DC motor Lazy Susan to be uh, the, this motor right here. And in my configuration on my driver station app, I have already gone in and uh, given it the, I've, you know, I've plugged in my motor to a port, and then I've already uh, gone into the configuration and given that port the name and the motor type. This is and so you could do hardware map dot get, and that'll just go through your configuration file and like search through it to find this DC motor. And then give it the exact name that you gave it uh, when configuring it. If you have, if I put Lazy Susan, it's going to give me an error. If I put Lazy Susan, it will give me an error. Error. You need to have the same name, no extra spaces, like the correct capitalization. Everything has to be the same as in your configuration file. That has given me many errors. So if something happens and you get uh, an error when you're running a program saying, like, we couldn't find your motor, it's probably that you got the name wrong. Um, so yeah, here's what you would do to initialize a variable when you're using a, uh, like, motor or sensor or anything like that. And just to show the people who don't mind in Java, doing integers can be a lot easier. You just do numbers. There you go. That, that would just create an integer with a value of zero. Oh, and also with Java, every line needs to end with a semicolon. The semicolon tells the um, compiler that this line of code is complete and to move on. If you don't have that, then it thinks that like having this is equivalent to having that, which is confusing for the IDE and it will not run correctly. Um, so now that we have our motor, we can start 
program using that motor. So some other, uh, all of your assigning of motors and sensors and servos should happen during the initialization. And other things that would happen during the initialization is setting up your motor to how you want it to run. So with my lazy Susan, since it is going to be rotating this, I want it to be using an encoder, and I will go over encoders a little bit later in more depth. But basically, the encoder keeps track of how much your motor is rotating, and you can set it to um, basically rotate a set amount of like ticks. Um, so how you do that is you do your lazy Susan, and then you hit dot. And dot will call all the methods from your program, um, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, but I'm going to want it to set run mode. Run mode. For instance, this will be one of this might be one of your initialization steps, uh, and that's going to let your tell your robot that it's going to be using encoders. Another and then the Sorry, another initialization step might be setting the zero power behavior. Um, and zero power, zero power behavior uh, relates to how your motor is going to stop when you tell it to stop. So there's two different power behaviors. You can either set it to break or to float. If you set it to break, then that means that if you set the power of the motor to zero, the motor is going to instantly stop and it will not let the wheel like move any farther forward. If you set it to Float, then when you set the power to zero, it won't supply the motor with any more power, but it also won't forcefully like, stop it from moving. So that means that when you're driving, if you have a motor, all of your driving motors set to brake, it'll stop exactly where you want it to stop. But if you have float, it'll kind of continue moving on due to that previous momentum and drift forward to stop. I would recommend during your autonomous period, especially having all of your driving wheels set to brake because that'll just make your programs much more consistent and um, accurate. You're, like, it'll make it much more likely that your uh, robot will move in the same distances every single time. Okay. How you do that is you set zero power behavior, and then one second. This should be doing auto complete. And I'm not entirely sure. Why it is. Ignore this for one second. Okay. Uh, so here, I'll just mention this real quick, but something nice about uh, using the blocks and onboard Java is that, say, you're doing what I'm doing right now, and you're trying to program an onboard Java, and if for some reason it's like not entirely like popping up with the autocorrect, or you can't quite remember like what you're trying to be using, like you forgot the name of a uh, line of code, what you can do is you can go over to blocks, and the blocks, you basically can outline every single option that you have, which makes it a lot easier for remembering like what you're supposed to be using. Um, so once you find that, if you drag it to the program, it automatically converts your program into Java. So then you can just copy and paste the line that you were looking for into your, and then copy and paste it into your normal Java program. So here, just so I make sure I'm telling you the exact right code, since it's not letting me do the uh, autocomplete. Here's the two codes. So I have, yep, so that was meant to be set mode, not run mode. And then you see motor. Motor, not run mode. That was my Gracie, I think you misspelled the using, run using encoders. <laughs> like, you misspelled using. You forgot the S. <laughs> anyway, yeah, and then, so there's your set mode, run using encoders, and then I'm going to set the zero power behavior, and then I'm going to set it to zero power, there we go, and break. Oh, yeah, and that can also help you catch when you're misspelling things. 
because the autocomplete will normally pop up if you're spelling things correctly. Okay. Uh, and then the final thing that you might be using with your motors during initialization is reversing the direction. Uh, the reason why you'd want to do that is because if you look under here, you'll see that I have four drive wheels, or four driving motors, and two of them are pointing one direction, and two of them are pointing in the other direction. And what that'll do, uh, it, well, okay. so the motors are always going to be turning in a counterclockwise direction when you give them a positive value for power, which is what sets their speed. Uh, so if you give them a positive power, they're going to be spinning in a counterclockwise direction. But when you have motors that are facing different directions, both spinning in a counterclockwise direction, some of those wheels are going to be moving in the other in the wrong direction. Basically, if you want them to all be moving forward, so instead you can set the you can uh, set direction. Well, you can set the direction to reverse, and then uh, for the motors that are facing in a different direction, uh, and what that'll do is it'll tell it that with a positive value, instead of spinning counterclockwise, it's spinning clockwise, so that setting all four of your driving motors to one will actually result in all of your wheels moving in the same direction. So that makes it a lot easier doing the mental uh, math and thinking about it when you're doing driving, uh, instead of having to always keep in mind that, hey, if I want to move forward, I want to set these two wheels to be a positive one and these two wheels to be a negative one. Which is just an extra mental step which can easily be forgotten and resolved in your program not working. So here, sorry, I don't. I'm trying to do this copy and paste again because sometimes, yeah, the reason that this, um, the autocorrect is not working. I don't know why, but sometimes it just decides that it doesn't want to work until you get down here under your active op mode or until you build it once or twice. So it's, it's just not great. Right. Here are your three blocks that you might be using during initialization for your motors, along with your actual initialization for your motors. Once you've done all of your blocks, you'll be getting down to your wait for start, and then uh, once the motor, once the actual program is started, uh, during tally up, you will be having this while off mode is active block. And a while loop, this is a, called a while loop, uh, while loops will continuously repeat until this condition is false. And so you can use while loops for basically anything. Uh, the way that you program them is you type in the keyword while and then it'll light up slightly purple and then you give it a condition using parentheses. So if you say while zero equals zero and then your two brackets here for what's going to be repeated, then this whatever you code you put inside these brackets will just be repeated until infinity. Uh, because this condition will always be true. Uh, something else that you can do is you can have uh, while loops uh, while your robot is moving, for instance. They work great in conjunction with sensors. Uh, something that I do a lot during uh, my autonomous program is I will, I will set some motors to start moving up here. So I like set motors running. And then I'll have uh, while the distance sensor is greater than five inches away from the wall, uh, do nothing, and then once the sensor is within five inches of the while of the wall, whatever condition we gave it here, so sensor. So once the sensor is close to the while wall, uh, this condition will be false, which means that the robot will break out of this while loop and continue on to the code that's below the while loop. So you can do it. I use while loops a lot with sensors. Um, yeah, that's the main place I use them. Okay. Uh, but this while loop will be in all of your tally programs. What it does is it 
basically just continuously uh, updates the game pad uh, values that you're sending to your voters during the like duration of the program. So during tally up, all of your code is going to be within this file. For now, though, I'm going to pretend this is an autonomous program. And during an autonomous program, you will not have that while loop because your program will be moving linearly. It'll do one thing and then the next thing and continue that until the end of the autonomous. Okay. So now that we're to the autonomous program, I'm going to talk a little bit more about using encoders. So you heard me mention up here that encoders uh, are basically keeping track of how many rotations the axle of your wheel has done. And it keeps track of that using uh, ticks or clicks or whatever you want to call them. Uh, so that one full rotation of the wheel is going to be about 15, 12 to 1,500 ticks, depending on which voter, your brand, you're using. Uh, so when you're using encoders, uh, basically they help you make sure your robot's actually moving the same distance every time. The two main ways that you can keep track of how far your robot has moved during a contest are using encoders or the sleep lock. And the sleep lock is what it sounds like. It basically puts the program to sleep for a set number of milliseconds. You use that by just typing in sleep, and then the number of milliseconds, 2,000 would be two seconds. And what you can do here is, you would set the power of your motor or motors to whatever value you want sleep for a time and then the power is back to zero or to a new value. And this can work and it might be used during some parts of your program, but for driving this can be super inaccurate because what you're basically telling it is set it to some arbitrary power. And the way that you power motors is not using speed, uh, which would be very accurate with speed, but you're saying it to a certain power percentage from a range of negative one to one, uh, which negative one uh, to zero would go in one direction and zero to one would go in a different direction. Um, and this power, the actual speed of the motor when you're giving it a power can change with the battery percentage, it can change with the weight of your robot, it can change with basically a number, like a lot of different variables that can affect how far your robot's actually gonna travel during this two second sleep. Um, so something that you can use this kind of format for, uh, for instance, if any of you did Freight Frenzy, uh, with the carousel and the ducks, my team just used a sleep for the ducks because it didn't really matter what the actual um, exact rotations of that wheel were, it just needed to go for enough time for that duck to spin off the carousel and fall. So as long as you give it a little bit of padding, the sleep works every time for them. But, on the other hand, for driving, I would strongly recommend uh, using encoders. And encoders are definitely more complicated. That program, or that little program there was only three lines of code. Encoders will probably be about six to seven lines for one, like, motion. So the way you do this is, first, you're going to need to reset the encoders. You can just copy that and change run using encoders to stop and reset encoder. And what that'll do is it will uh, put your number of ticks at zero. Because otherwise, the number of ticks that uh, your encoders are reading is just going to like keep adding on as your wheel is moving more, which that mental math can get kind of exhausting by the end of our program if you're moving multiple times and your encoders are actually set to like 10,000 now. And also, while encoders are more accurate than sleep, uh, you're not going to be stopping at exactly whatever like position you tell the encoders to stop at. So uh, if you're at 1,500 ticks, you're probably actually going to be at like 1,500 and like 1,510 ticks or 1,490 ticks. So basically, you'll want to be resetting the encoders to zero every time you're using them. After that, you're going to give it a position to actually run to. So you'll be setting the target position to a number of ticks. As I said, 1,200 is about one rotation, so we'll do that. And then after you set the position, you're going to be setting the power that you want the wheel to be running at. 
So I'll set the power to 0.5. And then the next step uh, after that is to set the encoders to run to position. And what that'll do is it will be telling the uh, brain of the robot that that wheel or that motor is going to be turning until it reaches this target position that you set. So uh, once you do that, you need to add a while loop. And the condition for this is going to be while lazy, Su lazy Susan is busy. Because the motor will know that while it is while that motor is not quite to this target position, it's still going to, it's still working for that target position. It is still busy. Um, so you need to keep that. But inside the while loop, you can just put nothing. You don't need to actually have it inside it. Um, so once the motor has reached this target position, the Lady Susan will no longer be busy. This while loop, this condition is not false, and the while loop is broken, leading you onto the final code, which is setting the power back to zero. Okay. Can I ask a question there? Yeah. So we had a situation last year where our, our this wasn't great, but our, our motor was holding our arm in place, and we were using that to basically say, hold the arm here. But I think if we would have done that while we it would have always been busy because as soon as we turn the motor off, the arm would, would fall. So the motor was like fighting to stay in, in that position. Um, Do you have any insight? Like that works great when the motor can just go there and then turn off and everything's fine, right? Okay, so we can set the brake. Okay. So the front one you kind of hold is heavier than the brake. Yeah. Yeah, I think the main thing you would oh, want to do there is um, if a uh, brake will be able to hold like a couple of pounds, but if you're talking about like a whole arm that weighs a lot, yeah. what you might need to do there is add a counterweight on the other side yeah. of the Yeah, motor. we saw that from two, I just learned that this morning. Okay, the brake oh. I had never heard of before though. That's yeah. Okay. So the I other use, thing you can do is you might just have to get a little bit of Or yeah, um, sometimes yeah, what I've done in the past is I've given a motor like... I've given like a motor like 0.1 power in the past and had to just hold that there because that was the perfect power to keep it stationary. Okay, so instead um, of setting it to zero there, you would set it to whatever you need to yeah. hold. But okay. that's not the best practice because that will wear out the motor a lot faster than if you have counterweights or something yes. lighter. Okay. Um, adding gears too might be able to keep it a little bit stabler. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. So I also had a question. On this particular piece of code where you're talking about 1,200 clicks, earlier you talked about how depending on the weight of the motor, depending on the strength of your battery, you might get different results. But by doing it this way, if the battery is fully charged, half power might be pretty strong. It's going to get to that 1,200 clicks pretty quickly. If the battery is really low, half power might be really slow. It'll take longer, but it's still going to get to the same position. Yeah. Is that the goal here? Okay. Thank you. And if you really want to be fancy, there's something called the PFID, uh, which makes it even more accurate. But that's pretty high-level programming, so I'm not going to talk about that. No worries. All right. Um, so I'll demonstrate this code real quick. Uh, another note: uh, the way that you save a program in Onbot Java is by clicking on this little wrench. It'll fill. I've got lots of errors. Okay. Okay. Um, that good. is sorry. That is from one of my old programs. I'm just going to go ahead and delete that. Right. For some reason, it looks at every program in your list, mm -hmm. even though you only got one active. Yeah, that's something that's a huge nuisance. Okay. Yeah, something kind <laughs> of annoying <laughs> about um, uh, Onbot is that if you have one, like you can see, I have many programs because this is an old. Uh, control Hub from last season, if one of these programs has an error, none of them are able to be built. Uh, so make sure if you're seeing an error and your first thought is like, oh my god, something's wrong with my code, make sure you look at which program, oh come on, why are there so many errors? Okay, one second, sorry. Um, yeah, if you're looking, make sure you see which program exactly is having errors. Give me one second, these are all old, so I'm just going to delete the ones that are 
I think the problem here is that it's trying to look for a TensorFlow model that does not exist anymore. And, okay, You've got a lot of programs that are looking for a different configuration, like with a camera. It's um, I have that TensorFlow model like upload, uh, but that TensorFlow model has since been deleted, which means that it is not like that. Oh. Okay, that's the last one. Other than this one, actually. Okay, so you can see my workshop demos program actually does have an error, and it gives me the line. That line is forty-eight. And that's odd. Okay. So that's saying that there's an error with my getting a uh, program. No. So I'm just going to go and do my trick of looking to see what's wrong there. <laughs> Oh, yep, sorry, I forgot to mention that with the hardware map, you need to add a class for what exactly you are getting. Because uh, this the program is not really going to look through every single configuration you have and search for the name. What it'll do is it'll see that you're looking for a DC motor, so it'll look through your list of configured DC motors to look for that name. So uh, you'll be using a different name here for color sensors, distance sensors, uh, servos, all of that. Okay, now we should be good. It sometimes takes. <laughs> All right, so our build was successful. No. All of that, we should be able to go down. And uh, if you don't know, on this driver app, all of your teleops, which this is in as a teleop, are going to be on this right arrow here. You can scroll through and see all the names. And then all of your autonomous programs will be under this left arrow. So I'm going to scroll and find my workshop. No. Yes, it's called Workshop Demos. I'll hit initialize, and then when I start, this should move about to here, or to there. <laughs> uh, because right. you have it set to reverse. Yes, I reverse the direction, so I was going another way. Yep. Uh, so encoders, as I said, they're very useful, they're autonomous, and uh, I'll also mention that they're amazing for figuring out preset levels if you have some type of arm on your robot. Uh, like last year, Great Frenzy, we had that hub, and that hub had three different levels, and then there was also a ground level. So my team used drawer slides, and we had four different buttons on the dry on the uh, driver controller. So pushing these four buttons it got you to a the exact right height for one of those different levels. And you could do the same maybe with arms rotating to a certain like uh, angle or something like that. Alright, any questions about encoders? This is not the right program. Okay. Alright, so that's uh, the main things you'll need to know about uh, motors. There's also, okay, moving on. Let's, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the gamepad. So, with the gamepad, uh, you'll be using this only in the teleop when you're physically driving the robot around. And there's two different uh, but there are basically two different ways you can use the gamepad. The first way is using the triggers, or the triggers and these um, joysticks. 
and uh, those are going to be used for anything that you want to have its range of speeds. So when you do um, these, the value that's like returned to the program is a double. So if you only push it a tiny bit, it'll return as say 0.1. While returning it, while pushing it all the way, it returns as either one or negative one. Uh, the other type are all of the buttons, which there's a lot more buttons than there are uh, joysticks and triggers. So with all these buttons, these are not going to be returning a number, they're going to be returning a boolean. So pushing on B will return that B is pressed, and otherwise it just returns that B is not pressed or false. So you have to be careful when using the gamepad, because if you um, try to assign uh, you're just going to delete that. So say I'm trying to program the Lazy Susan to work with my driver hub, if I'm, or with my controller. The way that you can do that is you do whatever motor name you have, and then set power, power to gamepad, and uh, also I'll quickly note, there's gamepad 1 and 2, that corresponds to whether you're pressing start A or start B. So make sure that you got those. Uh, the game had one and two right, or you might be wondering why the driving's not working because you put it under the wrong game pad. So I'm going to be using game pad one for now. Um, sorry. Okay, so anyway, yeah, so you're setting the power to a game pad. And if I try to set my power to game pad dot A, it's going to probably give me a fail because of incompatible types. I'm trying to convert a Boolean into a uh, double to set this power. Instead, what you need to do for motors when you're just directly setting a power to a gamepad is set it to, say, right stick Y, for instance. Um, I'll quickly show you. I'm pretty sure if you just put point and then hit control space or command space on the map, so gamepad one, period, and then control space, it'll give you all those different um, uh, button trigger things on the gamepad, along with whether it's a boolean or find one. Um, yeah, so boolean or float. It'll tell you. So if you don't know, just look. Alright. Anyway, so now what I'm doing is I'm setting the power to a actual value number. So it'll let me and take it forever. Build was successful. And I'll just show you real quick. Right. So I have my program. I'm going to pull it, make sure to plug in my gamepad. Make sure you push start A or start B. Or start B if you're using a uh, gamepad 2. Initialize. Earlier that when you're using Tally app, you need to have that while loop. If you don't have this while loop, what I was experiencing was I would hit play and the program just stopped because all I did was um, I set the lazy power to what was then zero, the program moves on, and that's the end. The program ends. Uh, so when you have it in the while loop, while well, auto is active. Now it's going to continuously loop through whatever code you have in here, for now it's on this one line. So it'll continuously loop through this one line and constantly look at the gamepad values and continue to update the gamepad values. So that's how you'll be using drivers. Um, yes. So most of your uh, driving motors are probably going to be using a stick or a trigger. And you can see here. I can either move it slowly or I can increase the speed a little bit just by changing how fast I'm doing this. Um, yep. uh, okay. So most of your uh, motors are going to be set to some type of varying number uh, where you can have that like slow or fast by pushing more or less on the trigger and uh, joystick. But say you're using some type of a gripper or you know, basically something where you want it to either be in this position or some other position. What you can do then is use those buttons. 
So you have approximately 10 buttons that are really useful on each gamepad. Some people will, uh, if they run out of buttons, which it might seem like a lot, but every year my team is always struggling to figure out how to add different buttons. What you can do there is uh, basically experiment with combinations of buttons or, yeah. Uh, so what you do then is you would have to use a if block. And for those who are new with Java, if blocks, um, and then you can also add a, sorry. If blocks are kind of like the while block where you need to have a Boolean as the conditional. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say if gamepad one dot x, uh, and this will basically say true if the x is being pushed in and false if it's not. Uh, so if the gamepad x is being pushed in, do whatever is in here. So open river. And then I can also add in an else if. Uh, and else ifs only work directly after an if. You can't just have an else if in the program. You need to have it right after an if block. So else if game pad dot y. And then I can close the river. So what the if, else if, and I can even add in an else. I don't know what you would want in an else in this case scenario. Um, what this is going to do is first it's going to look and see if the gamepad X is being pushed. If it is, it's going to open the gripper and then it's going to skip over all of this code and do whatever is next. Uh, if the gamepad X button is not being pushed in, then it's just going to return as false. The program will skip over whatever you have in these, in these brackets. And then it'll look at your second condition, else if. And if the gamepad Y is being pushed in, it'll close the gripper, skip over the else, and do next. Uh, and if the gamepad Y is not being pushed in, then it'll go on to else, do whatever you have in between these brackets, and then leave the if block. So with the if, else if, and else, you can only do one of whatever is like in your brackets. You cannot have uh, if the gamepad X and Y are both being pressed in, it's not going to close the gripper. It's only going to do that first condition and then skip over everything else. So make sure you're ordering them in the correct order if you're using uh, else All right. Um, okay. So that's motors. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about servos too. Because if uh, anyone doesn't know what a servo is, they're basically a smaller motor that can only handle about two pounds. But there's a, they're a little bit tricky because there's actually continuous rotation servos and a normal servo. And continuous rotation servos are able to rotate in one direction continuously for as long as you want it to, uh, or in the other direction as well. A normal servo only has 180 degrees of rotation. Uh, so it cannot rotate in a complete circle, it can only rotate halfway. Uh, and instead of setting a power to a regular servo, you're going to be setting a position. So I have... Uh, keep running into things. Uh, so this is what a servo looks like. My team personally loves the Go Build of servos because they're actually dual mode servos. So. So this is called a servo programmer. It comes with GoBuild servos, and what you can do here um, is plug in the servo along with the battery and change how it's going to function. So you can either make it operate as a continuous servo or as a regular servo. Servo, there's a little switch here, and then you can also uh, test its range of motion using these buttons. So you can make it if you're using it as a normal servo. You can make it go all the way to one end of the range and all the way to the other end of the range to see if that range is going to work for your gripper. Uh, and using some code, it's very common that you're going to add some type of claw or gripper, and then when you're trying to program it, it doesn't actually close or open all the way because your range of motion does not line up with, like, the gripper. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to skip over that real quick because this was taking longer than I thought it would. Um, 
So basically, you configure them in the same way and uh, say you would servo, servo, equal, stuff like that. The way you do that is um, you just have servo dot set position and you can give it a number between zero and one. Um, hey, Mr. Hansel, do you know what time the uh, host meeting is supposed to end? This was supposed to panel five is about here. Uh, real quick, since I do think that sensors are important, I'm going to go over time just a little bit and talk about uh, these three servos. I'm going to the IME servo can detect the position of the driver hub. So it's built into all of the sorry, control hubs. It's built into all controller and expansion hubs, and it's um, very complicated. So if you're looking to use the IMU, what I would suggest is either look at the YouTube video that the P3 YouTube channel will have posted in about a week or two, uh, or try to find another resource. Or there's also a sample program under here, a, uh, the sensor IMU program can also help you learn. Uh, that'll be very useful when during the autonomous program trying to turn, say, exactly 90 degrees or trying to drive forward in a straight line. Uh, and then these other three servos are the color, the distance, and the touch sensor. The touch sensor So the touch sensor is called the touch sensor. You initialize it in the same way as a you know, hardware map. Dot get this touch sensor dot class and then whatever name you have. Uh, and then these are actually not going to be used probably too much because the touch sensor, you know, you touch uh, it looks like. It looks like this. If you push in this button, um, it this little light button, uh, light lights up. Why don't we take a few minutes to see if there's any questions? Okay. Well, okay. Anyway, uh, all of these videos are going to be published on the P3 YouTube channel. I'm sorry, we didn't quite make it through everything, but are there any questions? Any questions about this? Yes? I've got one. Uh, you guys for your code in GitHub? or somewhere off of the robot? So the way this code is stored, um, you're going to be programming from this web browser. And how you do that is you connect to the Wi-Fi that's basically coming off of that hub as a direct Wi-Fi mm -hmm. connection. I'm good with that. Do you, do you save it anywhere else, like in a uh, code repository? We just download the code to the computer, but I think you could probably upload it to get mode if you want. Yeah, sure. OK. Is there an actual download button? or you, cause What I saw is you just had to like copy and paste it out of there. Uh, no, so say workshop demos, you right click on the name, and you okay. can copy and download. download the video. OK. OK, cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, sensor videos will be up hopefully in about a week. Sorry that we didn't quite get to those.